Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon to vote in the Disney Princess poll and crap character sheets, and like and subscribe for stronger bonds next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Garnet from Steven Universe. If you're not familiar with the lore, she's basically one of the main character's three adopted moms that's actually a fusion of a space princess and her bodyguard with future sight and giant robot punches. I think I've been watching too much anime. All that complication didn't really phase me this time. <laughs> Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to see into the future, and our knowledge of future events will make them so bright we'll have to wear shades. Next, we need to punch with big old rocket fists to hit like a truck. Finally, we need to transform. It's not exactly going to be a fusion because there aren't mechanics for that in D&D, but it will be temporary buffs that make us hit like an even larger truck than the truck we were hitting like before. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just watch your strength and intelligence with all three of your eyes. Strength will be number one you're the strongest of the crystal gems, and they're intergalactic superheroes, there's some competition there. Intelligence next, your hair is so big because it's full of your big brain. Although it's not really hair, it's the same inorganic material as the rest of you, we'll get to that. Charisma after that, you live in a quasi-musical universe, and your songs fully bop. Follow that up with Constitution, again, you're made of inorganic material, and your fighting style is pretty up close and personal. Wisdom is a bit low. You might have three eyes, but they don't help you see why kids love the taste of Cinnamon Toast Crunch. They just help you see into the future. We'll dump Dexterity for the same reason we frequently dump Strength. We don't really need it, and we can augment it later with skill proficiencies. But first, the real question, what is a crystal gem in D&D? Since they're all different and grown for different purposes, I reserve the right to build future gems with different races, but Garnet definitely has the thickest skin, is a result of fusion, and is made of inorganic material, so I'd say Warforged works best. Warforged get plus two constitution and plus one strength, though that plus one can go anywhere really, it just works really well for giant robot fists. Integrated protection lets you fuse with armor, which isn't exactly fusion, but bear with me here. Ruby was a bodyguard for Sapphire. That's kind of like armor, right? This lets you join with armor and add one to its AC. Nothing can unfuse you without your permission. Because of your constructed resilience, you have advantage on saves against being poisoned, resistance to poison damage, immunity to disease. You don't have to eat, drink, breathe, or sleep. Instead, you can take a sentry's rest, giving you the benefits of a long rest after six hours of standing still. And you get a free skill of your choice, I'll go for performance. Again, all the gems can sing. Take the soldier background for athletics and intimidation skill. That's Garnet and Ruby's background, so it's like two-thirds of your background, or like, would it be more like three-fourths? I'm not totally sure how the math works out on that. We'll kick things off as a fighter for two skills from the fighter list, like acrobatics and history. You get a fighting style, and if you're sick of the unarmed fighting style from the class feature variants on Earth Arcana, join the Patreon and vote for characters whose fighting style isn't punching. But unarmed fighting lets you hit people with unarmed attacks that deal 1d6 bludgeoning damage or 1d8 with two Two free hands. You deal 1d4 when you grapple someone and an extra d4 when you hit creatures you've grappled, letting you get big hands so they'll know you're the one to beat them up. Second Wind lets you heal 1d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action to recover a little bit in case you need to get ready to go for round two. Second level fighters get Action Surge, letting you make two actions in one turn once per short rest. Think of it like a fusion turn. Third level fighters can choose a martial archetype and champion works really well for someone who's good at seeing where the enemy is going thanks to improved critical, letting you critically hit on a 19 or a 20 for double the chances to absolutely wreck someone. I was going to go with Cavalier, but Cavalier's abilities mostly require a weapon or a shield. I was actually going to go with Paladin too, but you can't Divine Smite on unarmed attacks, so Champion's kind of the only one that works here. I guess you could also go Battlemaster, but I feel like Improved Critical works well with the future sighty stuff. Fourth level fighters get an ability score improvement or a feat. The lucky feat will give you three luck die, which are d20s you can use to reroll an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, or you could use it on someone who's attacking you to make them worse. This will be our first piece of future sight with one die for each eye. Fifth level fighters get an extra attack, letting you make two attacks instead of one with your action. Fighting you is basically going one on two. Now that we're able to properly brawl, let's get some methods of handling the gems that aren't punching, even if you're really good at punching. We'll dip into wizard for this, letting you grab three cantrips, and boy howdy, why do I feel like this build is going to need true strike? Maybe it's because divination is your thing, and the spell gives you advantage on an attack roll next round like you saw into the future and knew where the enemy would be. Maybe it's because I wish I didn't have to explain to some people in my audience that not 
every piece of media has them in mind as the target audience. You don't have to like everything, but if you attempt to empathize, watching media created by people from different backgrounds can be a great way to learn about an experience that's different from your own. And if empathy is too hard for you, the very least you can do is just not watch it and shut up. Mending lets you fuse two pieces of something together or patch up small cracks and things. Minor illusion creates a small visual illusion, but I'm more focused on the audible illusion so you can get your songs to have some backing tracks. It's a pretty major flex to start singing on someone while you're fighting them. That's gotta throw them off their game. For spells, we're gonna focus on flat buffs that won't require concentration because I'm saving that concentration for something later. Maybe you can see what I mean if you have future sight. Long Strider increases your movement speed by 10 feet, jump triples your jump distance, both last for a minute. Shield adds five to your AC as a reaction when paired with your Warforged AC, this would be 24. That's pretty tough to hit. Technically, you can learn six spells at this level, but you can only prepare an amount per day equal to your intelligence modifier plus your wizard level, so that's what we're focusing on here, otherwise the video gets a little too long. You also get Arcane Recovery, letting you recover an amount of spell slots equal to half your wizard level on a short rest, minimum of one here, so you can still do that at this level, that's why they give it to you at this level. Otherwise, that'd be kind of mean. Second level wizards get a school, and the school of divination will give you more future sight with the portent ability, which are two d20s you can roll at the start of a long rest. Then you can apply them to a d20 roll of a creature you see later that day. Bad rolls go to bad gems. Good rolls go to good gems, like you. For this level's spell, Thunder Wave forces a constitution saving throw on creatures in a 15-foot cube in front of you, dealing 2d8 thunder damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. You also push them back 10 feet if they fail. In my home games, I count that as a fall if they hit the wall, but you do you. Third level wizards can learn second level spells. Enlarge Reduce will let you make yourself larger for an extra d4 of damage with strength-based attacks and advantage on strength checks and saves. It lasts for a minute depending on your concentration. You you could also do the opposite to creatures that fail a constitution saving throw, but that's not really in character. Getting bigger punches is, though. Fourth level wizards get an ability score improvement. Let's invest in the main wizard stat, strength. I mean, obviously the main wizard stat is intelligence, but wouldn't it be wild if we made a build that was primarily a wizard and focused on strength? That'd be... That'd be weird. For this level's spell, See Invisibility lets you see invisible creatures and objects for an hour with your magical eyes. No concentration required here, so you can be giant and visual at the same time. For even more strength, let's go back to Fighter Level 6 for an ability score improvement and take strength to cap it off. How could you have seen that coming? Other than, you know, me telling you. 7th level champions are remarkable athletes, letting you add your strength modifier to the distance of a running long jump and add half your proficiency bonus to skill checks you're not proficient with that use strength, dexterity, or constitution. This includes initiative rolls, which is good because at the moment your initiative is negative one, which doesn't feel totally accurate for someone who has already watched the fight play out. Speaking of that, 8th level fighters can get an ability score improvement or a feat. The alert feat lets you add 5 to your initiative, you cannot be surprised while you're awake, and nobody gets advantage to hit you just because you can't see them because you kind of still can. Back over to Wizard now, 5th level Wizards can learn 3rd level spells. Protection from energy lets you give a creature resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage for an hour depending on your concentration. You're able to soak up an absolutely massive amount of damage and come out relatively unscathed. 6th level Divination Wizards get Expert Divination, letting you recover a spell slot one level lower than the divination spell you cast. See Invisibility is currently our only divination spell of 2nd level or higher, but hey, that's an extra 1st level slot, not bad. For this level spell, Tongues, is a third level divination spell that lets a creature speak and understand all languages for an hour. Flying around space, I'd imagine it's useful to understand the locals. Seventh level wizards can learn fourth level spells. Banishment works kind of like a bubble, forcing a charisma saving throw on a creature. Failing that, they are sent to a harmless demiplane or their home plane for up to a minute depending on your concentration. You hold it the whole duration, they stay in their home plane, but that basically just means no muss or fuss for Earth for their foreseeable future. This is pretty much the best you can get for a bubble in D&D. Eighth level wizards get an ability score and improvement. Let's get that intelligence up for harder saves on the banishment. For this level spell, locate creature lets you find a creature you know of within a thousand feet of you, or a specific kind of creature, like a gem. It's also divination, so grab a third level spell back if you want. You deserve it. Ninth level wizards can learn fifth level spells. Teleportation circle opens up a portal for a round that can bring you to a permanent teleportation circle you're aware of, like the one in Beach City, which can be really helpful if you've got a busy day of day saving ahead of you, and you don't want to just, like, fly all the way back to Earth. 10th level divination wizards get a third eye, which is pretty fitting for someone with 
three eyes. This lets you pick a special kind of sight until you finish a short or long rest, like 60 feet of dark vision, 60 feet of ethereal sight, 10 feet of invisible sight, or the ability to read all languages. Honestly, they're all pretty useful, and you can probably figure out which one you'll need when your party is taking a short rest. Generally, people like to discuss what they want to do the next day before that. For this level's spell, dip back to the fourth level for Stone Skin, which will give a creature you touch resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for an hour, meaning no amount of pummeling will be able to hurt them. Well, that's not true. It'll just take twice as much pummeling as it normally would. 11th level wizards can learn 6th level spells, and it's time for a fusion transformation. Tensor's transformation will let you make yourself stronger with 50 temporary HP, advantage on attack rolls with weapons, and an extra 2d12 damage on non-spell attacks. It lasts for up to 10 minutes depending on your concentration, and when it's over, you'll have to make a DC 15 constitution saving throw to not suffer a level of exhaustion, but you've got a plus 7 to that save, so it's pretty likely you're going to be fine. Still, fusion can be exhausting. I'd say the best way to really activate fusion in 5e would be combining concentration spells all stacked on one creature. So for Sugalite, pair this with an enlarged spell from Amethyst, or for Sardonyx, pair this with a haste spell from Pearl, and for Alexandrite, do both. I know I'd be cool with it as a player to effectively take a session of combat off to turn a party member into a kaiju, but make sure that you're getting everyone else's okay before you do that. Also, they don't technically have to hide, they would just have to worry about dropping concentration if they didn't. Pearl probably has the war caster feed. She'll be on a redemption poll if you want to vote for her. Our capstone is the 12th level of wizard for an ability score improvement. Get your intelligence as high as possible to banish gems instead of shattering them. For this level's spell, Contingency lets you cast a spell of 5th level or lower that will activate sometime in the next week depending on the condition you set for it. For example, protection from energy when you take fire damage. This basically lets you store spell slots for the next day. Typical sapphire behavior, always thinking ahead. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, Tensor's transformation basically makes you a fully invested melee fighter without having to fully invest in melee fighting. It's a really good spell. Next, you have five methods of chaos control with your future sight per day that will really annoy your DM, but keep you safe, so that's nice. Finally, you've got so many weird spells that can fill niches normally not covered on our spell lists. Your DM might not even remember that there are options for you. For weaknesses, low wisdom means that even if you can see into the future, you might not be able to prevent some nasty saving throws. Dexterity is another very common saving throw, and you're even worse at that, so fireballs and meteor swarms could be an issue. Finally, concentration becomes a problem when you've got two defensive options and one offensive option using some of your higher level spell slots. But that's why it's the crystal gems, not the crystal gems. Gem. Team up with your friends and save the day. And if you think you can't look into the future and alter it until you find a way, I think that's how the theme song goes. Just keep an eye out for those saving throws. It would be really embarrassing if something managed to trip you up. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, subscribe for more. We make two videos every week. Join the Patreon to vote for your favorite Disney princess, Merida, Elsa, or Vanellope, and sub to Tulak and Mango for more Tulak fun.